This week at Starbase, SpaceX launched its seventh Super Heavy Starship flight test, and although it wasn't without a few issues, it certainly was exciting and should yield plenty of data for SpaceX to comb through ahead of their next flight, which for now is still expected in the very near future. Now let's dig into this week's update. Starting off the week in the early hours of Friday morning, the next four ring section of Booster 17's liquid oxygen tank was brought from Star Factory to Mega Bay 1. A little over an hour later, the empty stand was brought out of the building, indicating that the section had been lifted and stacked with the upper part of the tank. With preparations for launch already well underway at Starbase, the detonation suppression system under the launch mount was tested. A few hours later, the testing continued with the actuation of the flaps on the recently stacked Starship 33. Late that morning, as SpaceX prepared for a wet dress rehearsal, workers were evacuated from the build site by buses. Several hours later, the chopsticks were opened and raised into the launch configuration ahead of the upcoming test. Next, Stage Zero got to work, fully loaded both of the vehicle's propellant tanks with super-chilled liquid oxygen and methane before eventually detanking. That night, the chopsticks were brought back down and closed in on Ship 33's lifting points ahead of de-stack of the vehicle. To that same end, just after midnight, the Starship's transport stand was returned to the pad. About an hour later, the launch mount work platform was also brought back to the pad to allow crews access to Booster 14's engine bay. Later, a concrete pump truck set up near the new subcoolers at the west end of the orbital tank farm. The truck quickly started working and the pour continued over the next two hours or so. While the concrete work was underway, Mechazilla lifted Ship 33 off Booster 14 and brought it down to its awaiting transport stand on the ground. Later that morning, by looking at the reflection in the Star Factory windows, we could see that the scrapping of the test tank B-14.1 was underway in High Bay. The bottom of the article was cut free and the upper section lifted out of the way. By late morning, Ship 33 had been secured to its transport stand and the chopsticks were lowered from the rocket's lifting points. Back at the build site, one of the Star Factory doors was opened and a telehandler emerged, carrying a stainless steel mystery box. What do you think's in the box? Oh, uh, what's in the box? Let us know what you think in the comments below. Around that same time, the large Buckner crane at the launch complex laid down its boom in anticipation of the coming launch. With the wet dress rehearsal now completed, crews were seen in lifts working on both of the Flight 7 vehicles, attending to final preparations before launch. That evening, a section of the B-14.1 test tank was brought out of High Bay and taken to the scrapyard at the Sanchez site. In the early hours of Sunday morning, one of the Block 2 ship lifters was brought to Mega Bay 2 from its storage space by the Rocket Garden. With Ship 33 at the launch complex for launch, this was an indication that Ship 34 would soon be ready for testing. Late that morning, the chopsticks were returned to the lifting points on Ship 33. The rocket was then lifted into the air and placed back on top of Booster 14 to await their launch. The stand for the launch mount work platform was brought back over towards the pad area as preparations for Flight 7 continued. With the ship once again stacked, its transport stand was moved out of the area. At the build site, the top of the B-14.1 test article was brought out of High Bay and taken off to the Sanchez site for further scrapping. SpaceX's large crane began to lower its boom to better help protect it from the launch. There seemed to be some issues though, as the lowering was aborted, then retired before the boom was eventually left up for the night. By mid-afternoon, the work platform was lowered back onto the stand and moved away from the pad. Having deposited the last piece of B-14.1 in the scrapyard, the crane returned with the load spreader and took it back between the mega bays toward the rocket garden for storage. In the early hours of Monday morning, SpaceX could be heard testing the igniters on the rocket ahead of launch. Meanwhile, back at the build site, the ship cryo testing and transport stand was brought into the ring yard area to await ship 34. 
rover camera caught some ring sections being brought out of the Star Factory and taken towards a scrapyard at Sanchez, a sign that SpaceX is still fine-tuning the construction processes inside the building. And just a few hours later, a truck arrived with new hardware for Star Factory as the internal fit-out of the building continues. With the flight stack seemingly ready for launch now, the hot stage adapter stand was brought back out of the launch complex and returned to the build site. That afternoon, a large CO2 tank was brought from the Star Factory to Mega Bay 1. This is likely for Booster 16, where it will be installed under one of the chines and used for purging the engine bays. Back at the launch site, the chopsticks were opened from around Ship 33 and raised again to their launch position. Early that evening, rover camera caught the delivery of a new Starship Aflap. The article was offloaded and taken into Star Factory. As Monday came to a close, Ship 33's transport stand left the launch complex and returned to the build site to await use by a future Starship. On Tuesday morning, crews finally succeeded in lowering the boom on the SpaceX crane, preparing the equipment for the launch. As the boom was going down, crews could be seen lowering one of the safety net platforms down the side of the new launch tower, notably without the assistance of a crane. At the build site, workers were seen moving several yellow racks over to Star Factory. Around that same time, the last of the previous generation of booster transport stands was brought from the Rocket Garden and taken into Mega Bay 1. That afternoon, Booster 12 lifted onto the newly arrived transport stand. By placing the only flight-proven booster on this obsolete stand, they have freed up both of the new generation stands for use by new boosters. Shortly after midnight, the rocket was brought out of the building and staged in the ring yard. A few hours later, the ship testing stand was moved out of the ring yard and into Mega Bay 2. As the shuffling continued, Booster 12 ended its brief stay in the ring yard and was taken between the mega bays to the rocket garden for storage. Later that morning, Ship 34 was lifted off of one of the work stands in Mega Bay 2 and placed onto the waiting test stand. At the launch site, another round of igniter testing could be heard. Later, the yellow racks were seen being brought back out of the Star Factory and taken to Mega Bay 1. That afternoon, Ship 34 was brought out of Mega Bay 2 for the first time. Interestingly, the ship does not yet have its aft flaps installed. Within a few hours, the Flight 8 Starship was rolled out of the gate and onto Highway 4. Over the next two hours, the vehicle made its way through the fog and arrived at the Massey Outpost for testing. In the early hours of Thursday morning, Booster 14's transport stand was brought out of the rocket garden and staged in the ring yard area in anticipation of a successful catch. After the sun rose on launch day, SpaceX performed another test of the detonation suppression system to ensure it was ready to go. Up the road at the build site, the old and no longer used Raptor installation platform was brought through the build site and then taken towards the scrap yard over at Sanchez. As we crossed over to less than six hours until the opening of the launch window, the chopsticks were open and raised to their launch position. Once the arms were in place, the landing rails were raised to prepare Mechazilla for a potential catch attempt. As morning turned to afternoon, the road was closed, the pad was cleared, and Stage Zero was brought online. At 37 minutes after 4 p.m. local time, Booster 14 lit its 33 Raptors and launched from Pad A at Starbase. Aside from a superficial piece of steel on the ship coming loose and flapping in the wind as if it were a piece of rubber, the first stage of flight went smoothly with the stack powering through Max-Q and onto most engine cutoff. As Ship 33 lit its engines and pushed away from Booster 14, the Super Heavy flipped around and began its boost back burn to return to the launch site. Despite having one engine fail to relight, the burn did its job and Mission Control gave the OK for Booster Return. Then six and a half minutes after liftoff, Booster 14 came screaming back down towards the launch site as it once again lit its inner 13 engines, notably including the one that had failed to relight for the boost back burn. 
As the rocket slowed, the ring of 10 engines shut down and the three center engines maneuvered the vehicle into the awaiting arms of Mechazilla for a soft touchdown on the landing rails, completing the second catch of a super heavy booster. However, as we were marveling at the amazing catch, Ship 33 began to lose engines as it continued its burn. A little less than eight and a half minutes after launch, SpaceX permanently lost communication with the Starship. Later, spectacular footage began to emerge from the Caribbean of Ship 33 exploding and its debris field re-entering the atmosphere. Thanks to a post from Elon, we know that there was a leak above the engine bay firewall that overpressurized the area and eventually led to a fire and subsequent failure of the vehicle. Fortunately, it sounds like SpaceX understands the issue and has a plan to address it going forward. Overall, Flight 7 did deliver the promised excitement, especially with a second booster catch, but the loss of the ship on ascent and the failure to deliver on many of the flight's objectives for the first Block 2 ship quickly tempered much of that feeling. Within a half hour after launch, the booster transport stand was brought out of the ring yard and relocated to the roadblock to await eventual transport to the pad to retrieve booster 14. Meanwhile, as the booster hung from the chopsticks, fire could be seen coming from the rocket's main quick disconnect panel as excess methane burned off. Less than an hour after the catch, the quick disconnect hood was open and booster 14 was slowly lowered back onto the launch mount for final safing before the pad could be reopened. Switching over to Florida, early on Friday morning, Doug returned to Port Canaveral with both of the recovered fairing halves from the Starlink Group 12-11 launch. An hour later, a short fall of Gravitas was towed into port, carrying booster 1086 from that same mission. Booster 1077 was lifted off the dockside stand and transferred to a transporter for its return to Roberts Road for refurbishment. That afternoon, with the stand now empty, Booster 1086 was lifted off the drone ship and transferred to the processing stand. Up the coast, Falcon 9 Booster 1067 lifted off from Space Launch Complex 40 on its record-setting 25th mission as it sent another 21 Starlink satellites to orbit. The next afternoon, a short fall of Gravitas was towed back out to sea in support of another Starlink mission. A few hours later, Doug followed the drone ship out of Port Canaveral in support of that same launch. On Sunday morning, Bob returned with both of the recovered fairing halves from Friday's Starlink mission. And just a few hours later, Just Read the Instructions was towed to the dock with fleet leading booster 1067. Within hours, the soot-covered rocket was lifted off the drone ship and set down on the dock to await processing. That night, just after eight hours in port, just read the instructions headed back out to sea and supported the Blue Ghost and the Hakuto R launch. Bob then deported the port right behind the drone ship to recover the fairings from that mission. Just before noon on Monday, Space Launch Complex 40 saw its second launch in under three days as the Starlink Group 12-4 mission took to the Florida skies. Later that day, over at Launch Complex 39A, a piling rig was spotted working near the base of the Starship Tower, indicating that SpaceX has likely restarted work on the launch infrastructure here. On Tuesday morning, Falcon 9 Booster 1085 was rolled out of the Horizontal Integration Facility ahead of SpaceX's 100th launch from the historic Launch Complex 39A. As the rocket was moving by, we could see that the piling rig was hard at work preparing the foundation for a new flame trench and launch mount. In the early hours of Wednesday morning, the Blue Ghost and Hakuto RM-2 mission lifted off from Launch Complex 39A, sending two different landers on their way to the moon, utilizing SpaceX's new dual launch carrying structure. And just before dawn, Doug returned to port carrying fairing halves 217 and 218 from Monday's Starlink mission. About two hours later, a short fall of Gravitas made its second return from the week carrying booster 1080 from the same launch. By that afternoon, dockside processing had been completed and booster 1067 and the rocket was lifted off the stand and placed onto an awaiting transporter. Early on Thursday morning, following some brief delays, Blue Origin launched the inaugural flight of their new Glenn rocket. 
the ascent looked to go as planned, and they successfully reached orbit on their first try. Unfortunately, after stage separation, the booster had some issues and they lost telemetry shortly after the start of the re-entry burn. The FAA has said they will perform a mishap investigation. And there you have it, another SpaceX and Starbase weekly update with a splash of blue origin brought to you by Lab Padre. Don't forget to hit the like and subscribe button if you haven't already, guys, and we'll see you next week. Thanks for watching. Lab Padres out.